Hello, and thank you for tuning in. I'm Lynn Berger, the host of Lynn Berger Interviews Remarkable People. And today I have the pleasure of interviewing Corey Muirhead. Corey, thank you so much for your flexibility. FYI, this was supposed to be an in-person, I was gonna be able to meet him today. And this morning we got a call that the studio was closing due to the uptick of the virus. So Corey has been so flexible to do this on Zoom. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, thank you. So Corey Muirhead is the executive VP of Logan Bus Company, president of New York School Bus Contractors, and he was included in the 2020 city and states 40 under 40, 40 rising stars in New York City politics. I am fortunate to have this interview with you. So Corey, I know that, you know, it's somewhat ironic that we're doing this on Zoom rather than in person. A lot of this interview, I'd like to hear about the effect your business, um, the virus has had on your business and industry. But before we get there, can you tell us what an executive VP does? Yeah, of course. So uh, Logan Bus Company is the largest privately owned school transportation company in all of New York State. Uh, we also happen to be the largest school bus provider for New York City. Um, we operate in all five boroughs in Nassau County under 10 different entities. We have uh, 2,500 routes, 3,500 employees. Um, my job is uh, rather, rather complex all at the same time. I, I'm responsible for maintaining revenue and maintaining relationships, uh, government relations regarding the Department of Education, City Hall, the council, uh, everything from there. Um, I'm the lead negotiator on all of our collective bargaining agreements with our various unions. We have three different unions. Uh, I am also responsible for all of our RFBs and RFQs and RFPs. Uh, those are requests for bids, requests for proposals. Uh, being that we are a government contractor and we mostly deal with municipalities, most of our co contract work is bid on. And uh, that is a large, very large portion of our business and I'm responsible for putting together those bids and proposals. Um, in addition to that, obviously, of course, the, the general operation and the daily, daily functions of the business to maintain its efficiency and operational ex excellence. Okay, it sounds like a lot of responsibility and it sounds like you're surely up for it. Now, one of the reasons I really did want to meet you and interview you, I um, became aware of the virus and how it affected your industry. And I think it would be very interesting for people to understand that. So can you lead us through um, from last March forward, how you were initially affected and what has happened since then? Sure. So if I'm not mistaken, the day was Friday, March 12th, where all schools shut down for the foreseeable future, uh, meaning there was nothing open. And, um, you know, obviously that was very scary for our business. That was scary for our employees. Um, and we had to figure out what was going to happen next. You know, subsequently after that, uh, schools did not reopen for the school year. Uh, they were shut down from March until September. So it was extremely challenging. Uh, there were many layoffs. There was many sleepless nights knowing when and if, how we were going to come back, what fashion we were going to come back, when we were going to come back. You know, luckily we were able to navigate this and luckily we were able to have good communication with our school districts and, and you know, with the mayor's office and, and the Department of Education to make sure that we were able to successfully get through this all together. Um, like I said, everything shut down. So from March until about July, I'll call it, uh, you know, people were laid off. It was very disheartening. It was upsetting. It was it was difficult because you had to lay off, you know, 3,500 employees in the middle of a global health pandemic. You know, many employees went without health insurance, and that that's not, you know, that 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 really didn't sit right with me. Uh, luckily, we were able to keep some employees on when we started to talk about settlements with our school municipalities and and things like that. Uh, so let's talk about when we shut down. There was a lot of contractual ambiguity on what we were to be paid and what was going to happen and things like that. And we stopped receiving revenue. So the immediate first thing that we had to do was lay everybody off. But then in talking with the 
customers and talking with the, the municipalities, we explain to them that we're not just a school bus company that provides one service. School transportation is, is one of these services, the many services that we provide. We provide background checks and compliance. We keep our we keep our buses safe with DOT. You know, we have a myriad of things that we need to do before a school bus even steps on the road. So explaining all of those services, and we'll call them back office services for layman's terms here, explaining all of the back office services that we provide in addition to rolling school buses was eye-opening to municipalities, was eye-opening to the general public as you saw school buses on the national forefront in school reopening in September. So people really started to understand our in industry and understand the intricacies of what takes place and how complex it is to run a school bus. When that really started to come to light, we were able to really come to a better understanding and, and, and really come to some good settlements with our school districts, our municipalities, and, 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 so, and our customers so that we can retake our employees, bring them back in, pay certain health insurances and, and things like that so that we would retain our industry that had already been decimated due to the pandemic. So mm. we're very fortunate to be back to work. We're very fortunate to be running a lot of school buses albeit it's very different. And, you know, we could talk about how September brought change, but it was a really nervous time from about March to I'd say June, July, when nobody knew what we were going to do and everybody was laid off and there was really no light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was, it was extremely educational and, and not, and knowledgeable. And that was a, a large part of our job over the three, four months, you know, educating people and, arming them with the, with the knowledge that they needed to make informed decisions about, you know, paying school bus companies and retaining them and keeping the contracts, uh, you know, status quo so that we can be there for them when we reopened in September. Um, obviously, one of the biggest things that is a misnomer is that the, the school bus companies, you know, education starts with the school bus. What I mean by that is your school bus driver takes a kid to school. Or she gets to school via the school bus. Therefore, if they did not get to school via the school bus, how would they get there if the parents are working? We start the educational process. And I think that we really got a lot of respect in that, in that, in that realm when all of this happened, when you saw just how important it was to have school buses on the road to get these kids back, people really started to understand our industry and pay attention to us. Right. You know, I know it's overused, but that silver lining of, you know, people, there's some good coming out of this. You know, we realize a lot of people didn't realize how important and vital the day started with you. So, you know, if there ever is a silver lining. So tell me what it was like being a leader during those months. Were you challenged? Do, you know, how, what, take us through something that you really felt good about that you were able to accomplish? Well, it was very challenging and it was very nerve wracking, but it was important work. And like I said, I believe in what I do and, I, and this is fulfilling to me. So I was very happy to lead this charge. And I've been in this industry for 11 years and this is my home. And I would like to stay in this industry for forever. Um, what I would say the most challenging thing was, was the education process, changing the minds and the molds that have been there, you know, the foundation of what the school bus was and the understanding of what people had that, you know, to the untrained eye and ear, the first thing they're going to say is, well, if there's no school buses rolling, then we shouldn't have to pay. And that educational process of explaining, well, before a school bus gets on the road, you have to do drug tests, background tests. You have to have compliance with your, your vehicle. They have to be insured. They have to be, uh, they, ha they have to be inspected by New York State Department of Transportation. You have to have 30 hour classes. You have to have all these things in there, all these services that are provided that people don't know about before a bus ever hits the road. You know, it's not just like a car where you call your insurance company, you get your insurance card, you get your registration and you're on the road. It's far more complex than that. So that educational process was extremely difficult. And then the negotiation process was difficult too. You know, luckily we love our industry and we've been involved very, very long. So there were creative ways to get the settlements going. You could avoid state aid and, and ratios and things like that that I won't get too into, but that's where I really liked my, you know, that's where I spent the majority of my summers looking at creative alternatives and looking at creative settlements to make sure that my employees were protected and the businesses were protected. Now, of course, 
the school district's job was to make sure that they were protected and make sure that there was transportation that was going to be readily available. And I was glad that we were able to come to many common uh, mutually beneficial settlements that took place um, as a part of the president, you know, being a part of the presidency for the New York School Bus Contractors Association, one of the best things that we were able to have is there's a hundred school bus companies from as far as Rochester and Buffalo to down here in Suffolk County. Our association are like-minded, smart executive individuals, and we were able to, to group think and share our experiences and our negotiations and what was working and what wasn't working and alternative methods. And that's where I bring up the state aid ratio and, and other settlements that, that took place from there. That is, extremely heartwarming because we're all competitors at nature. We're, we're separately privately owned businesses that bid against each other that quite often sometimes take each other's work through bids and, and competitive practices that the association was on its heels, decimated, no revenue for months. And we were able to come together through the association and figure out ways to progress the industry. No, I'm extremely proud about that. I'm extremely proud to lead that charge. I'm extremely proud to you know, lobby on behalf and speak to the to the to the edu uh, elected officials and, and have them understand school buses. And like I said, we saw an opportunity when school buses were the forefront of the national news because we were coming back to school and we jumped on that opportunity and we, we threw the gamut at them. This is what we do. This is how we're protected. This is why it's always so reassuring. You know, you don't constantly wake up in the morning. Is the school bus going to be there? You just know. You know it's going to be there, yeah. and there's and there's there's a certain reliability to that mm -hmm. that it's reassuring, and there's a lot of work that goes behind that, far more than anyone understands. So when we saw the opportunity to explain that to the key stakeholders and explain it to elected officials, we ran with it, and I think we did a very good job of getting our message out there. So, what so it's very different, and I apologize for cutting you off. It's no. very very different. It's ever evolving. A couple of the things that we did, and one of the things that I'm proud of as well, over summer, I sat on the New York State Regents um, Task Force for Reopening Schools. And, and in these discussions with the chancellor, we spoke about what the school bus would need, would, would need to do mm -hmm. to stay safe and how kids could be safe on the school bus. Mm -hmm. So some of the things that we must do every day mm -hmm. is we must sanitize the bus no matter what. Uh, on a daily routine. We use CDC recommended OSHA compliant uh, solutions, topical solutions to, to spray on the bus to make sure all the highly top topical and touched areas are um, sanitized mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on the bus. A normal school bus seats anywhere from 40 to 50 kids, depending on size. We reduce that capacity by at least 50%. Mm. Uh, there's one kid per, 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 per seat, excuse me. So that, that was a hit, obviously, having 50% capacity is challenging, Absolutely. but you have to be safe. So maintaining social, social distancing as much as humanly possible, and of course, wearing of masks is mandatory in all of our school buses. That's the number one thing that we said from everyone. The driver has to wear a mask, the matron has to wear a mask, and all of the students. If you're not wearing a mask, they will have to talk to the parents, we'll have to talk to the schools. Everybody's in this together. And what we preach to our teachers, we preach to our, to our employees, our drivers and everything, is you have to buy into this. Because the only way schools are going to stay open and the only way we're going to be able to operate is if we all buy in and we, we, we do our part. Mm -hmm. So it's extremely important. Treat it with the severity that it needs to be treated. Wear your masks and, and clean your buses every day. Another good thing that we proposed that state kind of adopted was loading from the back to the front. So what that did was that minimized interaction between people crossing in the aisle. Obviously, the aisle is only 22 inches, 30 inches in between. So when you cross there, you're right on top of somebody. That was a great solution. And what it is, it's first on, last off. So first kid gets on, they're the last to unload. That's, that's proven to, to help dividends as far as interactions. So we've been operating pretty well. Uh, schools are closed and there's still, there still has been outbreaks and things like that. But one thing that I'll mention, and this is, you know, this is something that, that I, I've really spoken a lot, a lot about over the last week, actually, is the school's infection rate is less than 1%. I believe it's somewhere around the 0.3 range. The city infection rate is 8.9. Nassau County infection rate is just around 9% as well. But the school's infection rate is less than 1%. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you everybody's buying in. 
everyone that goes to school, everybody that's a that that's a uh, a, um, a, a professional service that provides the school, a contractor or a teacher or a parent, everyone wants to keep these schools open. Scientific studies show that younger kids need to be in school to, to get a better education. And we are all doing our part to make sure that the school infection rate is staying as low as it possibly can. That's great. So are you seeing when you're letting 50% on the bus, is that, how does that work with how many kids are in school? Do you have to run more buses or it's kind of worked itself out? So it's kind of worked itself out, but you're right. Luck, luckily, there hasn't been an overcrowd. That was one thing that we were very nervous about. But I believe the latest numbers for New York City was that only 30% of children are going to school. Mm -hmm. So as we see increased capacity, mm -hmm. we may see some overcrowding of buses. Like I just said, it hasn't happened yet, but um, there hasn't been an increase in buses. With schools that have shut down and schools that have closed for COVID cleaning and so on and so forth, we've been able to dispatch other buses. God forbid there is a situation. So look, all this has been a learning curve for all of us. This is all, you know, plug and play to a certain extent. So when we identify an issue, we do our best to mitigate that issue. Luckily so far with some of the school closures, we've been able to take additional capital from those buses and use it to help out in areas where we have seen there have been um, potentially more buses needed or overcrowding. Well, it seems remarkable that you've done this and also to keep have kids keep their masks on. Have you had any issues with that? Um, of course, yeah, you know, there's always going to be some rascals, but the, the drivers, <laughs> the teachers, the schools, everyone's done a great job. I, I can't emphasize enough how important our message has been, how important the, the, the Department of Education's message, the teachers, the schools, everyone needs to buy in. If we want to keep schools open, everyone needs to play their part. And for the large majority, everyone has played their part. And it's been great. Times like this show when we all really can come together, put put any everything aside, when we put our minds to something and we, when we truly want to do something, we can have it happen. Yeah, it's a testament to the people that ride the bus and to the bus company. It's a social experiment too, right? You're, you're faced with adversity, you're faced with the crisis. And I think that, you know, the true identity of people come out. And like I said, the, the, the school infection rate being below 1%, Show, is a true testament to the goodwill of people. Yes, yes. It's a win-win for everyone, right? Yes. Now, moving forward, have you seen or started to think about any of these practices that you had to put into play that you might move forward when hopefully things do go back to, quote, normal? I think the sanitizing of busing will stay around. I think it's important. When you have so many children that jump on a bus, especially when you start talking about the full capacities, 44 kids, 55 kids, if they're youngsters, 60 kids, that's a lot of bodies on a bus and that's a lot of germs. And mm -hmm. I just think that given what we know now about germs and washing your hands and covering your mouth and so on and so forth, I think it's important to sanitize, regardless if COVID is back or not, if there's another virus or anything, it's just good hygiene mm -hmm. and good health practices to make sure that we stay sanitized. So I think that cleaning will certainly come um, from, a, from an efficient standpoint, if we're able to, I think loading from the back to the front is great as well. As long as the kids all get off at the same school or something like that, it improves efficiency and it limits the time in between stops because kids aren't crossing each other. So yeah, from, from, from shaving down time and efficient standpoint on, log on the logistics side or the operation side of a school bus, I think that should stick around as well. Um, yeah, I would say that those two things are definitely going to become a best management practice moving forward for our industry. You know, I don't know if this could ever happen, but probably wearing masks for a long time would help even in flu season. I, I think so. I think, you know, there's, there's obviously a big debate about how much longer we have to wear the masks and things like that. But look, you know, I'm a firm believer in if, if that's the minimum that you have to do to play your part, let's do it. And if that's what's going to keep you safe, for the 30 minutes or an hour a day, you're on the bus and you have to wear a mask. Let's just make sure that we do that so that we can stay open. Yeah, especially for the bus drivers, mm -hmm. you know, being on the bus for such a long period of time mm -hmm. might be one good thing if we need to wear masks. You know, flu season, people get sick. 
Certainly. And like we just spoke about, a driver has to interact and, and, and engage with 40 to 50 to 60 kids a day. That's a lot of times that they'll be past germs or, 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 or interact, you know, face to face with people. So are you talking about, um, you know, I know it's only January, but we're thinking maybe next September is when we will maybe go back to a full year. Is that correct? Is that what you're thinking about full capacity? So I'm not sure, like I said, this is all ever evolving and this is a, this is a learning curve for all of us. The conversations I've had with DOE and, and, and you know, the, the, the higher ups in, in the city government is we're, we're taking this one day at a time and we are making sure that we can stay open for next week, let alone next year. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is going to be ever evolving and this is going to make sure, we just have to make sure that we continue to do our part. We have to make, we have to continue to get the success stories out there and the, and the good things. You know, the city rates at nine, but the school infection rates at one. If that continues for month on month, then maybe we could increase capacity and progressively. You, you wanna do it in steps. You don't wanna just throw everybody back into the industry. Um, back into the schools, excuse me. Um, but yeah, I think that if we continue to hear the good news, we should certainly start to progressively get back to where we were. L let's kind of do a little bit of a stress test and see how gradually we can, we can, we can increase capacity. No, I, I agree. It's, you know, time is marching on. March is going to be a year. It's mm -hmm. unbelievable, right? It truly is unbelievable. It feels like March was three years ago. <laughs> Well, you work three times as hard, probably. So what else in your job, like I, now that you're dealing with COVID so much, are there things that you're looking forward to going back to that you were able to spend time on? Yeah, I think one of, one of the biggest things, for, well, two big things for me, but technological advances in my industry. Um, New, Logan Bus will be the first New York City contractor to put electric school buses on the road. That's a pet project of mine, and yeah. I shouldn't even call it a pet project. It's a long overdue project. It's a, it's a passion of mine. We see electric as being the future. Uh, there's still a proof of concept out there, especially in metropolis areas, metropolitan areas mm -hmm. like New York City, densely populated, a lot of stop and go, uh, city mileage that that remains to be you know seen. I'm extremely passionate about this project. I'm very excited for it. I've been dealing with some, some very high up people. I've been dealing with some great companies that have helped me get these things. Well, not they're not built yet, but they're being built. I'm, I'm very excited to put those on the road and see how they operate. Um, I want it to be first to market. You know, I want it to be an innovator in my industry and my, I wanted to have my company be the ones to, to, to put that out there. So for me, the first order of business when all this kind of settles down and I could really focus elsewhere is getting those electric school buses on the road. Uh, they were supposed to be on the road in September. So that was upsetting to me. I had to, you know, push that project off one because of revenue purposes and two, because I, we just couldn't do it. We couldn't build the infrastructure and so on and so forth. But like I said, that's a, that's a passion project of mine that I'm going to make sure I see to fruition and they're on there. Uh, the second thing, other technological advances would be, you know, lifetime GPS and parent tracking. Um, mm -hmm. A few years ago, there were some hiccups in the school bus industry and city council passed uh, some legislation that I actually helped and, and provided information on. And I'm a big believer that school buses should, school, parents of school bus children should be a same, afforded the same luxury as an Uber driver and, and ordering an Uber. Uh, you order an Uber, you see every turn that that bus, that, excuse me, that Uber driver makes to get to your house and then you get to watch the route as it goes on. That's where I see the school bus industry going. These parents need to know where their children are at all times. We live in such a crazy society and things could happen like what happened with the snow day a couple of years ago where buses were stranded for hours on end on the FDR for 11 hours or something. That's insane. That's crazy. I, I'd, be, I'd be so scared. Um, we need to make sure that our industry advances. And I'm a big believer. I read a ton of business books. I read, I, I, I have a lot of people that I look up to and it's always the disruptors and the innovators that get ahead. You have to be the ones to identify what the next big thing or what the, what the progression, natural progression of the industry should be. And I see those two key things as the progression of our industry. And I wanna be the leader there. Wow, I asked the question. I didn't think I was gonna get. So electric buses, are yeah. they gonna be, is it gonna go one by one? Like how is that gonna, how so, are you 
the electric buses on the road? I have an order for five. One is one is almost complete, completely being built. I built we built the infrastructure first, uh, and they're going to be housed in Brooklyn. So it, I'm going to be very I'm very excited about that, and I'm hoping that I get one on the road pretty soon before the end of the school year. We'll see. I have a conference call with them tomorrow, and I'm going to really make them make them get on get on it. But uh, I'm excited. I'm really excited about this. I really really wanted to be the first to market especially with so much going around and not apolitical, just, just everything that, that shows, you know, electric really is the future. And I want to show that the school bus industry, which has a history and kind of has a, uh, um, people, people look at the school bus industry as being archaic and antiquated. I want to change that misconception of us. And I want to show that, Hey, the, executive VP of the largest private school bus company in New York state and the president of the contractors association put on electric vehicles in 2021. They're ready to move forward. He wants to advance this industry. So that's something that's near and dear to my heart and I'm excited for. Well, I got such a wonderful answer there. Hopefully I can, we can have another interview in the studio and talk about the electric school buses on the roads. That's great. That's fantastic. I want to thank you so much for this. This was wonderful. It was great to meet you. I'm sorry we couldn't do it in person, yet I think I'm going to meet you in the future because I think there's things more to talk about here. So you stay well, stay safe, and thank you so much for a wonderful interview.